Hello, welcome to Good Friday 2021 here from Parkstone Baptist Church, Mance. Very glad you're joining in with me. Uh, we can't do what we do in our usual ways during this Holy Week. It seems very odd to be a year on from last year where it was the same, to be in the same place, but hopefully moving forwards positively in many ways. But to be here in the same place and not able to do many of the things that we normally do. We can't sing, uh, we can't be together, not until we reopen the church building for public services anyway. Um, and we can't do many of the things creatively and other, other ways that we've done together through Holy Weeks over many, many years. Um, but we are where we are, as we say, and I'm very glad that you're with me now. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And with those words of the Apostle Paul at the beginning of his letter to the Galatian churches, we pray. Lord Jesus, on this day of holy memory, you carried a cross along a city's cramped alleys through the gate to a hill bearing our burden. When the time was ripe, the cross you carried carried you. Yet you did not lay down our burden or cast it aside. For this you came, to this you dedicated your whole life. By this the world would know love, God's love, redeeming, reconciling, restoring love. Lifted high before the watching world, some scorning and scoffing, some wailing and weeping, some slinking in shadows, some stunned in silence, some standing by out of duty, some standing out of love, some regretful, some resentful, for the careless and uncaring, and for those who cared yet could only stare. You were lifted high, and you bore the whole burden of the world, our sin and guilt, our sentence and death, our sorrow, our shame, our suffering, in your body, in your very soul, in your heart of hearts, on that dead wood, fully, finally, forever, that by love's redeeming power, in willing sacrifice, in selfless service, in faithful offering, has become to us the very tree of life. In your death we view our own. By your death we see life. Through your death we know love, love unknown, known, utterly, absolutely endlessly, effectively, and enduringly. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. And continuing in prayer, you bore, dear Lord, a cross not your own, so let your own thank, praise, and worship you the Eternal Son, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit was and is God and shall be forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, pour your great loving kindness over us. And Father, forgive us, for we did not know. Father, forgive us, for now we know, but do not act as if we did. Father, forgive your children for the sake of the Son you gave for us all. Unblock these ears to hear the good news from the cross. Open these eyes to see your glory in the face of Christ. Wash away the indelible stain of sin by the power of his precious blood clothe us in our right mind 
that the truth that sets sinners free may make us whole. Take away the cold stone of our hearts and write your law of love in warmth and wonder upon them. Finish these your new creations for the sake of Jesus who for the joy of finishing his work endured the cross, shaming its shame, and sits at your right hand in glory. And joining with the words of the revelation to John, the worship of heaven and earth, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for us, Amen and Amen. In the church's long life, since the week in the life of our Lord Jesus that came to be called holy, his faithful people have tried through many ways to follow his steps to the cross on the bold as a skull hill called Calvary. In more recent times, this week of weeks became for many an hour on Palm Sunday and an hour on Easter Day. Oh dear, it wasn't always so and isn't, thank the Lord for all. In this week, Jesus' words with one sleepy head. I'm going to put my Bible to one side because although this isn't the word part of our Good Friday time, I have got some of my not very good drawings and things, scribbles, scrawlings, uh, just for this bit and for later. But in this week, Jesus' word with one sleepy head in the garden uh, speaks to me as it speaks at other times too. So, could you not keep watch with me one hour? It was to cocky Peter who a cock crow later would begin to understand what he had not understood, that only Jesus, only Jesus, was to face what lay ahead. Nobody else would, no one else could. We can't enter into everything that Jesus meant when he said to Peter and the sons of Zebedee, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. We can't go the distance, yet if we take from memory to mind his remain and watch with me, we may have an inkling. And it's only right that we do, that we should. Um, only then will we have an inkling, and only an inkling, when the next day Jesus shouts with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Wisely, the church, rather than speculate, has turned to the Bible to help her keep watch with her Lord and better know his sufferings. For she, for she is called to share in his sufferings and death, as Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 10. And Jesus Jesus calls each disciple to carry their own cross each day. Luke 9, 23. Psalmist, as in Psalm 22 and prophets, as Isaiah 53, through which we walked on Sunday evening several weeks ago, have helped the church keep company with her shepherd and saviour. There are their other places too, like the lamentations of Jeremiah, who, more than any other prophet of God's covenant with Israel, suffer for being the servant of the Lord, although all his servants, the prophets, suffered. Is it nothing, is it nothing to all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his wrath. Those were Jeremiah's words, perhaps about himself, well, about himself, first of all, but they're words with extra power and poignancy when placed on the lips of our Lord Jesus. I'm glad we still sing at Parkstone Baptist Church Wesley's hymn, inspired by these words, All you that pass by, to Jesus draw nigh, to you is it nothing that Jesus should die. Another holy week good habit to add to that one was to sing or read Jeremiah's Lamentations and think of Jesus. Lamentations chapter 3 for example deeply resonates with Gethsemane, Jerusalem and Calvary. 
Another good habit was to sing or say the reproaches. Um, these are a sustained reflection on the heartbreak of the Lord over his people by his heartbroken prophet Hosea, especially on chapter 11. The reproaches are sensitive to the sorrow of the God who had done so much for his people only to have them turn to other gods and walk in their way, some of which were pretty hideous and horrible. O oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Tell me. Moses would have shared Hosea's sensibility to the sorrow of the God who suffers his people. I did say suffers his people. And only the God who suffers people would be prepared to come and suffer for them. The reproaches are not an indictment of the Jewish people or even of the particular men who wanted Jesus dead. Instead, they recognise that our whole human refusal to honour the Creator or give thanks to him, Paul's words in the first chapter of Romans, is the root of the sin of the world for which Christ died on the cross to return us to God and godliness. We are all in this together. <laughs> That's not just uh, Covid. There is solidarity in sin. But this is a solidarity that offers no hope or help to sinners. We all fall down. Our childhood's nursery rhyme enacts our wretched reality without the one who is able to raise us all up. I hope you will suffer in that King James version of the word, meaning of the word, uh, my attempt to suffer this long treasured means of Christian meditation in my own way. So let's be still and let's hear the heart break of the Lord, of the one through whom all things were made. My people, what have I done to you? How did I offend you? Please tell me. I made you. I made you in my own image to be like me and to look me in the face. I placed you on the face of the earth that I filled with good things entrusted to your care. But you no longer face me. You have turned from me. My likeness is unrecognisable. You reject me and despise me. My creation is distressed. My creatures under strain. My children die and I am filled with grief. With what I made by my creation, you have made destruction. With my own hands I fashioned you. Yet with your hands you have fastened me to this cross. O oh, most holy God, may your mercy be upon us and our children. My people, what have I done to you? How did I offend you? I made my children of one body, one blood, a single people, that they, though many, should be one. One in purpose, one in joy, one in love. But you have divided what was united severed what should not be separate, dismembered the members of your own body. You fight among yourselves, you hate and kill one another. One considers themselves better than the rest. You call each other fool, loser, scum, scrounger, enemy, no friend of mine. You do not have enough bread and you wonder why. Do not break the bread you have to share it with another. What you do to one another you have done to me, and in my body I bear your wounds. O oh, most mighty God, let your mercy be upon us and our children. 
my people, what have I done to you? How did I offend you? I came among you a servant and a king, your God, and yet you. I came like the littlest and least of your sisters and brothers, yet when I was hungry you did not share your bread. I was thirsty and you threw away your plastic bottle. Because I didn't look like you or spoke a different language or saluted a different flag or came from a country broken by war and poverty, you did not welcome me. You looked at my clothes and judged me, but you wear the clothes my children slave to make. I was sick, and you would not share your jab. I was in prison, and you said hanging was too good for me. You pierced my feet with nails when I'd washed your feet. You'd made holes in my hands when I'd made you whole. You pierced my side with a spear when I'd asked you to keep your sword stuck to your side. You crowned my head with thorns and a curse. But I'd laid my hands on your head to bless. O oh, ever-living God, let your mercy be upon us and our children. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. Though he has stricken us, he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. That we may live, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the rains of spring water the earth. words from the ministry and message of the prophet Hosea and chapter 6 of his book. And the words of this hymn, which I'm not going to sing, but if you wanted to tune to sing it to, um, I think it would be Northcotes, and from memory Northcotes would be O oh, my Saviour, lifted from the earth for me, draw me in thy mercy <clears throat> nearer unto thee. Don't know if you're able to tell, this is about my fifth attempt to record this today, and my voice is going, and... Uh, the Maundy Thursday one uh, took several attempts too because of interruptions and other things that were, have been going on. That's that. That's a manse for you. But I will read on. Or I'll begin again better. O oh, my Saviour lifted from the earth for me, draw me in thy mercy near unto thee. Lift my earthbound longings, fix them, Lord, above Draw me with the magnet of thy mighty love. Lord, thine arms are stretching ever far and wide to enfold thy children to thy loving side. And I come, O Jesus, dare I turn away. No, thy love hath conquered, and I come today. Bringing all my burdens, sorrow, sin and care, at thy feet I lay them, and I leave them there. William Warsom House words, and I'll just put the stand away for a moment, because I'm going to read now from the Gospel and the Gospel of Matthew, uh, which we join uh, at chapter 27 and from the 11th verse, and we're going to read quite a bit. It's one of the things we do at Good Friday, and Maundy Thursday very often do, is to read substantial slices of scripture, and not just a few words. So we join Jesus at the point of point in the Gospel of Matthew, where bound in ropes he's arraigned 
before the bench of Rome's procurator, Rome's representative with plenty potentiary powers, the powers of life and death in Judea. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So, after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realised that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And all of them said, Let him be crucified. And then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, <laughs> populous mobs and all the rest, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Ooh, if only with it were that easy, Pontius Pilate. Anyway, then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. And so he, so he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort, cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. And then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, 
why have you forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man's calling for Elijah. And at once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. Well, during Lent, uh, we've been in the first three chapters of Matthew's Gospel, noticing how Matthew carefully collects scriptures, loose ends to connect them together in Jesus as the Christ of promise and I'll put my tree with some loose ends and things on there very swiftly because it's going to go away in a moment. Uh, Matthew carefully collects scriptures loose ends to connect them together in Jesus as the Christ of promise. Jesus is the end of the scriptures in the sense that the end of something is its goal, its object, its purpose, its final destination. Let me just put the stand back and hope not too much falls off in the process. Um, some people say that all paths lead up the same mountain so as to say that all paths lead to God. Let me just put it back a bit, make sure I'm not catching fire to anything. That's my, my slight concern at moments, moments like this in confined spaces, especially with candles. Um, so some people say that all paths lead up the same mountain and so as to say that all paths lead to God. It'll be wise to check whether a path is in fact on the same mountain. Um, it's wise to check that the path leads to the top. It's wise to check that the person telling you the way to the top is acquainted with the route, has been to the top, has come back down and is qualified to take you to the top and better still willing to come with you. Might be an idea also to know something about what's at the top. You never know. Behind all that cloud it might be a volcano uh, blowing its head off as, um, as one is amongst others um, in Iceland. Uh, and, and Etna's really been kicking up a fantastic show for weeks now. Anyway, enough of one of my interests in life. Um, wisest of all will be to recognise that even if a route says it leads to the top and the guide says they know it well and will guide you, that the gospel says that the top of the mountain had to come down to the bottom because everyone was going every way but up. All were going down like the man trying to climb the down escalator in the department store. I won't be able to say that much longer, will I? Because department stores seem destined for another kind of end. But, changing subject back to what it should be, the Gospel says God came down. And when God came down, he said, I am the way, and come, follow me. Jesus is the end of the scriptures. They're long journeys goal. God come down that we might be with God. If we'd gone on from Jesus' birth and baptism, Matthew would have well trained us to know how this is so by continually saying something like, this happened to fulfil the word of the Lord by the prophet so-and-so, followed by that word with which Jesus came to fill out and fill up to the full. Word accomplished, promise fulfilled, job done, God spoke, and it was done. It may seem a bit odd then that just as Jesus comes to the place where he will gather all ends together in his redeeming work on the cross that Matthew seems to stop collecting ends. 
In fact, the last obvious loose end tied to Jesus is the one spoken by Jeremiah about a plot of land bought for 30 silver coins that the Gospels connect to the blood money Judas returned without waiting for a receipt. There are some of those not so obvious loose ends I talked about some weeks ago, like the first of Jesus' two loud shouts from the cross, chapter 27, verse 46 of Matthew, mistaken by the motley crew at its feet for a cry for help to the prophet Elijah. Now, how a dead man could help a dying man doesn't seem to have crossed its mind, but mobs have a strange mind if they have one and don't seem to mind, so we shouldn't be surprised. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is the cry of the innocent, indeed just and righteous sufferer of Psalm 22. The psalm that in places paints the cross of Christ before our eyes like nothing else, yet finishes with, sh with such a shout of joy, victory, hope for the world that the spiritual anguish and mental and physical agony at the beginning is barely worth comparing to the ending that is its result. At the same time, Jesus' cry of total desolation is about as close as we can come to sense what it meant for him who knew no sin, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, him who knew no sin to be made sin, to be made sin for our sake. Now, here be holy ground. Um, the cry of dereliction, the cry of abandonment, the cry of desolation. We tread carefully, or not at all, lest we magnify the severity of righteous wrath or minimise the severity of unholy sin and miss the serenity that comes of God's holy love at the cross of his Son, the world's Redeemer. Yet there are ends, there are ends in this part of Matthew's Gospel. The power of three was mentioned by Chris this last Sunday, Palm Sunday, uh, and yep, there are three three ends that I see here. First, there's an end to the temple. Uh, oh, I should have put up Jesus as the end of the scriptures, but that was out of out of place. There is an end to the temple, and all it stood for, chapter twenty-seven, verse fifty-one of Matthew great curtain, the great veil. It's not absolutely clear which one it was. Was it the one that guarded the holy place or the one that guarded the holy of holies, the most holy place? Certainly the uh, temple that uh, Herod the Great had built, the uh, great curtain screening off the holy place, the uh, first of the uh, holy places, the outer one, uh, was reckoned to be about 60 feet high. A massive thing, beautifully made and beautifully decorated. Uh, so uh, quite a quite a thing to rip that. But it was rent, it was ripped, it was torn. Because when Jesus shouts aloud for the second and last time and in quiet trust offers his life to his father, that thing happened. Uh, it ended, the temple ended. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Not from bottom to top, as if by many massive and mighty human hands, but from top to bottom, as by a swipe of God's hand or finger. By the way, don't make the mistake of pinning the tearing of the great curtain on the quake. Notice Matthew's careful order. Perhaps I should have done a uh, little picture for this, but anyway, Jesus' loud shout is followed by Jesus' perfect sacrifice, seen in his freely surrendered spirit. The torn curtain follows, the shaken earth follows that, and then there are the split rocks. Do you notice the sequence? And it's not insignificant, it's significant. The quake doesn't simultaneously or symbolically close the temple and open the way to God the death of Jesus does. The earthquake is a demonstration after the fact, a proclamation. 
It's the uh, Amen, if you like, to Jesus' shout, It is finished. That, of course, is in John 19. The earth was moved. Well, was the world, was the world of women and men moved? Well, not all, because the Jerusalem temple carried on a dying trade for another 40 years until 70 AD, when the Romans closed it down by burning it to the ground. But God closed it down the day that the body of his beloved son took its place, so that through him, by his sacrifice of himself, any of us, any of us, all of us, Jew or Gentile, woman or man, priest or not, could come and enjoy equal access to God. Jesus became the full, I'll just take that away from them, the full and final sacrifice for sin that all other sacrifices could only portray in some small way. He became the great and perfect priest that even the best of God's servants failed to be. And he became the living temple in whom we meet God. Destroy this temple, Jesus said, and in three days I will raise it up. And as John notes in that early chapter of his gospel, Jesus spoke not of Herod's building, he spoke of his own body. Jesus is the end of the old covenant's temple, priesthood and sacrifices for sin, the entire cultus, the entire cult. What they could only represent, he presented to the Father in his single, sinless, sufficient offering of his own body in their place, in our place. So there was an end to the temple in the death of Jesus. Uh, and uh, there was an end to death, the second of the three ends. And hopefully that will stay there. Chapter 27 of Matthew, verses 52 to 53. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints, that is Old Testament faithful believers, and don't forget, term saints in, in uh, Old and New Testaments is not of some specially cannon fired people uh, who've been fired up to high places by some decision by people on earth. The saints is the whole people of God, the whole of God's holy people. You know, you're a saint, I'm a saint, may not feel like it, but that is what God has said and that is God will make, make us be by his grace and mercy to his eternal glory and our everlasting good and benefit as i like to say anyway many bodies of the saints that is old testament faithful believers who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many now i have to say that matthew's greek there is a little bit curious and that presents a little bit of a poser uh, I'm not going to solve it all now, but 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 anyway, if I could have half an hour with Matthew, I'd not want to end the chat without asking, Matthew, what on earth was going on here? Yeah, you know, this business of the tombs opening and these dead people coming out and walking into the city and da 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 da, uh, and a flurry of questions would follow. Matthew, who, why, what for, how long for? You know, did um, did a Simeon come back and and, and Anna and Zechariah and Elizabeth, or, or or was it people from long, you know, sort of long, long, long ago? Yeah, me and mine. Did he come? Well, you know, whatever. And what happened next? Did they return to their graves? You know, go to lie down again? Um, did they live the rest of a natural life? You know, presuming they didn't have their families and friends to go to, um, uh, and 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 Matthew, these weren't resurrection bodies, were they? You know, they must have been more like the young body of the twelve-year-old daughter of Jairus, and the youthful body of the son of the widow of Nain, and poor old Lazarus, who'd had a price put on his head by now. Read about that in John twelve, weren't they? And Matthew, why don't we ever hear about these folks? anywhere else and when when exactly Matthew because you didn't make it perfectly plain our sort of English version struggle a bit here was it when Jesus died or was it when Jesus rose or did the good folk rest in their graves and tombs a while before strolling into town a day or so later 
And Matthew, anyway, anyway, isn't Jesus the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep? As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. So, so what are these? Now, the question I wouldn't ask, dear Matthew, is how? Because if God is God, and Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus restored life to the trio we know of in the Gospels, and Jesus is the resurrection and the life, as he said, and rose from the dead to not so much make it so, but to demonstrate it so, although making it so is part of it, because the word is in vain without the deed. You know, anybody can say anything, but unless they do it, pfft. And what God says is always done, and Jesus did the many other things he did, then, then that is one question, one question of quite a few, that I don't need to ask. That bit of ambiguity about when begins to resolve, I think, when we view it as a bridge of connection between our Lord's crucifixion and his resurrection. It says that the dead are raised like the temple curtain is ripped and the temple in effect comes to an end because the way to God is open. Uh, it's, 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 it says the dead are raised because Jesus died. Like the temple shut down because Jesus died. The price is paid. Full atonement, can it be? Asked the hymn. Oh, yes, it can. Fulsome atonement that reached back in time, even as it reaches to the end of time and reaches right around the world through time all the time. Atonement that moved the dead, just as it moved men hardened by sin sat near that cross, hardened by sin to death, to say, truly, this was the Son of God. John Owen, uh, who was um, Vice-Chancellor of Oxford University uh, a few hundred years ago, titled his great work on the atonement, the death of death, but that's the short title that goes on the spine of the book, because when you look inside, what I'm hoping it says, yes, it does say John Owen, Doctor of Divinity. The death of death in the death of Christ. A tremendous book and work on the cross of our Lord Jesus and the atonement he made at Calvary. The resurrection revealed the fact death had died. But the resurrection was not the act that raises the dead. The act that raised a few of the dead, as in, as in a way to say that this was the case, for a short yet significant while, and will raise forever all who sleep in the Lord Jesus, is the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all gone a bit fuzzy. Hallelujah. We sing in a short song, Alleluia, my Father, in his death is my birth. In his death is my birth. Those few, however many they were, lived again to die again, so that only Jesus is the first fruits of that glorious resurrection body to which Margaret Clarkson taught us to sing with joy in hope. I just need to get rid of those words from before. A resurrection body, young, radiant, vibrant, free, with powers unthought, undreamed of, how rich your joys shall be. I, I'm so grateful um, for Margaret Clarkson, for so many of her wonderful, wonderful hymns. Uh, absolutely spot on biblically and theologically. Um, she, she was a real, well, well, she was a teacher in real life. 
but she was a teacher of the church too through her hymnody um, and you know she taught me to sing to well the resurrection body uh, you know my body you know you know what it will be what I will be by the grace of God in his glory for his children um, adopted by his grace and mercy in Christ um, it's 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 a wonderful thing I, I I can't sing that hymn like like quite a few others these days um, but in resurrection bodies like Jesus very own you know you know without just stream with tears and sometimes just going into speechlessness I have to say um, but that's a glorious that's a that's a oh, that's a wondrous thing we should never be ashamed to have tears running down our faces or be stuck into silence sometimes lost for words lost in wonder love and praise should we you know anyway and there was a third end in this uh, part of Matthew's gospel well there's a third end in what Jesus was doing that's the real point Matthew was just telling about it wasn't he an end an end an end to sin um, an end to the temple an end to death an end to sin um, if you thought I was going about it the wrong way I wasn't really I was just trying to get to that um, in the unfolding because that would be well perhaps a bit more of the sequence you put an end to sin and then there's an end to death because death is the wages that sin pays and all the rest there was an end to sin the cynical cruel callous treatment of human life and the mockery of people's hopes and loves that was routine for the centurion and the soldiers the duty detail for the day for crucifixions ended in awe and frank recognition they were shaken to the core of their being we were wrong he was right we did bad he was good truly this was the son of god now was that a full confession of jesus christ as lord and savior eternally begotten son of god god of god light of light very god of very god begotten not made being of one substance with the father did they stand there confessing the as yet unwritten Nicene Creed and the Apostles Creed and the Athanasian Creed and the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Shorter Catechism and the Longer and the Evangelical Alliance's Statement of Faith and the Baptist Union's Declaration of Principle and well do you do, do you even know them let alone say them by heart of course not uh, I, I couldn't say them all by heart I can say some of them uh, by heart I can say parts of all of them by heart um, but I wouldn't be able to say all of them all of all of them by heart by such things we may be taught but it is not by such things that we may be saved there may be more saving grace in these soldiers well in a way simple yet old reversal of their view of Jesus and frank acknowledgement of his rank and right than there is under a bishop's hat and under the caps of other pastors too if i had killed a man and done my duty as i'd done it before and never given it another thought and then said this my stony heart would have had to have had to have been moved my soul shaken my sins surrendered my life submitted to a higher authority than the man who had sentenced him to death and the man at Rome he represented with terrible power. The centurion his men weren't finished new creations. <laughs> neither am I, neither are you. But they were old men being made new, or I'll eat my cap. There were at the grassless place, barren place called Skull, that place of death, abandoned hope all ye who stand upon it. Multiple end not because the story of Jesus is a story of many possible endings you know, we're not talking about quantum strings or something quite here but because he is the end he is the omega the omega of old creation and I'm not using that in one of the senses some of you will understand that I think but he is the omega of old creation and old covenant even as he is the alpha of the new and when we come to the cross of Jesus 
and confess you are the Son of God. Our ending lives are joined by God's grace to the life that never ends, the one life that never ends. And though hills and high mountains should tremble uh, and all that is seen melt away, his voice, the voice of Jesus, shall in triumph assemble his loved ones at dawning of day. Now I'm going to read the words of H. Albert Lewis's hymn written just after the end of the Second World War in uh, King's Cross, London, a devastated city, but where people were already hoping uh, for a more united nation, shall I say, and a state where the welfare of the poor would be taken care of and cared about, not just that of the rich and the powerful and the mighty and all the rest of it. I'm going to read it. Um, hopefully the music for it will play us um, out. Um, uh, and then we're nearly done. Uh, so let me let me read the words of this wondrous hymn. Um, God, I'm reading it because I can hardly ever sing it. I, I, I'm just absolutely in pieces these days if I sing this. And of course, a lot of churches don't even know it, let alone sing it. But I sang it first at a Baptist church in South Wales in a Cardiff, where my friend, a fellow student at my the theological college, Spurgeon's College, David Edmonds, had uh, been doing a kind of um, assistant pastoring role on the south coast of England uh, uh, for a year as a break from his studies. And uh, I think a stone fell up and hit David when he was cycling his bike, or he fell onto a stone. And that was it for poor David. Um, and I went with some of the other students and the principal of our college and all the lecturers. Uh, to the service and and we sang The Light of the Morning is Breaking uh, to the wonderful Welsh tune Cookie Bar um, and uh, ever since not only because of David but because of so many things and so many people um, uh, it does break me to bits but that's that's a good breaking that's a good breaking it makes us yearn doesn't it and strain our eyes for the day of redemption the day of grace and glory the light of the morning is breaking. The shadows are passing away. The nations of earth are awaking. New peoples are learning to pray. Let wrong, O Redeemer, be righted in knowing and doing your will and gather as children united the world to your cross on the hill. Your love is the bond of creation. Your love is the peace of mankind. Make safe with your love every nation in concord of heart and mind. Your pity alone can deliver the earth from her sorrows, dear Lord. Her pride and her hardness forgive her. Your blood for her ransom was poured. Your throne, a redeemer, be founded in radiance of wisdom and love. Your name through the wide world be sounded till earth be as heaven above. And though hills and high mountains should tremble, the world that is seen melt away. Your voice, your voice, the voice that broke the silence and the weeping of of. Easter day and turned it to joy. Your voice, the voice of the Good Shepherd calling his sheep to him. Your voice. Come follow me into this life of lives. This new creation. This new heavens and earth. This feast that never ends. Your voice, Lord Jesus, shall in triumph assemble your loved ones dawning of day. What a day to look forward to from this day, this good Friday. 
the prayer of Bishop Richard of Chichester, 13th century, something like that. Thanks be to you, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the insults and injuries you have borne for me. O oh, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. And I'll leave up the words because I meant to have them up, but uh, I was getting in a right muddle apart from a right emotion there. Uh, anyway, uh, so I will say goodbye and hope to greet you again on Easter Day uh, in the morning. Uh, not as early as we normally do because we normally start the day with early communion at eight o'clock and a breakfast to follow for those brave souls who uh, come and join me uh, before others gather later on. Um, but uh, but of course you could start it that early but uh, but I leave that to you, I leave that to you um, but I hope to meet with you again on Easter Day where the Lord who was crucified once for us is the Lord who was raised to life again for us and a little music to play us out. <laughs>